Welcome, everybody. Good afternoon for our first episode live from Washington, D.C. in ASN Microbe for Editors in Conversation on the Antimicrobial Agents and Chemotherapy Journal. It's a pleasure to be here, and thank you, our guests, for uh, your presence live for the first time. So we're making history on this podcast. Um, I want to thank everybody, particularly our producer, Ray Ortega, who is now here and actually met him for the first time. So it is really fantastic to do that. So this is a, a Editors in Conversation um, the, for Antimicrobial Agents and Chemotherapy. Um, you can find our journal at aac.asm.org with, you know, plenty of things to do this month. Uh, fantastic papers on mechanisms of resistance, pharmacokinetics, pharmacology of uh, antimicrobial agents, new antimicrobial agents, and clinical therapeutics, in, among others. Today, we're going to discuss a very important, a very hot and emergent topic, which is the treatment of a stenotrophomonas maltophilia infections is emerging superbug, a real emerging superbug, particularly affecting the most immunocompromised patients. And we have two distinguished guests um, to discuss this topic. Um, Dr. Maria Fernanda Mojica, who is a um, instructor at Case University um, in the VA Care Center and Dr. Sam Eichen, that is now a, a clinical associate professor of medicine at the University of Michigan. Um, they are being in the topic and we are gonna talk about uh, many interesting things. So welcome to the program and thank you for being here. Thank you for having us. Thank you, Senator. So let's, let's just start talking about uh, these this organism, Stenotrophomonas martophilia. And, and Maria Fernanda, you've been uh, working with these organisms, particularly in mechanism of resistance. So, so why is this, this organism important and why, what biological characteristics make it important as a superbug? Okay, so um, steno, for sure, for Stenotrophomonas martophilia. Um, steno is an environmental, non-fermentative, gram-negative uh, that has emerged as a very important opportunistic pathogen. Um, it has two main characteristics among others, but it is intrinsically multidrug resistant and uh, it forms biofilm on any surface. So in our bodies and in any surface. So those two characteristic combines makes it the best pathogen to survive the hospital environment. And uh, I say that it's opportunistic because it mainly affects people with some kind of condition. So immunocompromised or chronic, chronic, chronically ill or uh, um, the cystic fibrosis population is a high risk of acquiring the, this bug. And, um, but there are also reports of people, like healthy individuals getting infection by steno. So it is a true pathogen that is able to, um, you know, uh, confer in, um, infections in healthy individuals in the community and in the hospital environment. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for that. And we will come back a little bit of these important characteristics. But I want to put this into a clinical perspective. Um, and Sam, you've been dealing with these organisms for many years. Um, what are the clinical settings that you have seen these organisms particularly emerge in the last few years as a, as a, as a more, more persistent wave? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, so the, as was mentioned, there's a, a variety of patients who you might see this in. But um, really, there are two key populations where it causes serious clinical problems, uh, and those would be patients with hematologic malignancy, uh, especially uh, uh, myeloid leukemias, and then cystic fibrosis. Um, and we do see it in other patients, uh, certainly uh, ventilated patients, burn patients, a number of different scenarios, but where it tends to cause the biggest clinical problems uh, and can lead to absolutely devastating uh, infections and overwhelming infections and death in patients with uh, persistent neutropenia uh, or uh, consistent cystic fibrosis exacerbations in patients with CF. Uh, those are probably the two largest problem uh, populations. I can tell you I've been doing this... Um seeing patients for a few years now, and in our ICU patients, uh, probably, and I was in, on service last week, I've seen much more steno now, not only causing pulmonary infection, but bloodstream infections. Are, are you surprised 
Not no, bad. and and you know the uh, interesting thing is the other what I really should mention is that the only where you see steno is is essentially patients who have received carbapenems. So as we have uh, ESBL infections, AMC producers, uh, resistant pseudomonas patients get treated with carbapenems, that creates an ecologic niche for steno to emerge. And where we see it very frequently, and, and certainly in my ICU as well, is uh, uh, patients who are intubated and it causes uh, either respiratory infections, VAP, or uh, catheter-related bloodstream infections. What the really interesting thing is there is distinguishing colonization from infection, which I would challenge is, is almost impossible in those patients. And I'd, I'd argue that the majority of them are just colonized and it's not actually causing real problems with them. Yeah. Absolutely, and I remember that you um, you published a paper once indicating that the treatment with carbapenems was one of the main risk factors for emergence of of, of, of stenotrophomonas. So, Dr. Mojica, so why would that is from the mechanistic point of view? Why stenotrophomonas sort of thrives in the presence of carbapenems? It's not that it thrives; it's selected by previous carb, uh, carbapenem treatment. And it's because it is, like I said, is uh, is yield with two potent beta lactamases, neurochromosomally encoded. Uh, one being the L1, which is a metallo beta lactamase that itself is a fascinating enzyme. It's unique as it, it works as a tetramer, and it confers resistance to all beta lactams except astronaut as any metallo. And then the other is the L2, which is a class A beta lactamase that provides the resistance to Astronam. So when the patient has been treated with uh, different rounds of carbapenem, those uh, carbapenem intrinsically resistant microorganisms to suffice, you know, they are, they are, are selected and among them is the yeah. So you are in love with L1 carbapenemase, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. So, um, so tell, me, tell me why. So compared to other metalloenzymes like NDM, IMP, and others, what makes L1 so special for you? Well, first, those two enzymes are inducible enzymes, and they are both controlled by the same mechanisms as uh, they resemble the expression of AMCs in Pseudomonas aeruginosa. So once the L2 is expressed, the L1 follows. And like I said, um, structurally, the L1 functions as a tetramer. So that is unique, that no other, no other beta lactams um, work as a biological entity for, you know, uh, as a tetramer. But also, and I've been studying these beta lactamases for not many years, but not maybe three years. Or a four. few years, a right? A few years. <laughs> and they are very diverse. And the L1s, as it has been shown with some uh, new variants of NDM, the L1 holds the zinc very tightly. So in other words, the MICs of some of the L1 variants that are the clinical ones that are in the, you know, affecting the patients right now, when you do the MICs with the normal media or with the zinc depleted media, the MIC doesn't change that much. So that that's, is fascinating. That's fascinating. Yes. You see, the audience, there's no boring superbug, okay? So you want to study, study superbugs. So uh, Dr. Eichen, um, so one of the things that I've noticed in the last few years treating patients too is that our drugs, trimetropine sulfa, the, the quinolones and, and you know, the, the cephalosporins um, are no longer active against these organisms. So uh, tell us a little bit about the resistance particularly to trimetropine sulfa and other drugs that is emerging in stenotrophomonas maltophilia. Sure. And I, I'd just like to say it's amazing how much I'm learning right now just sitting here. It, it, hearing you talk about beta-lactamases is just a wonderful thing. Uh, so keep doing that. Uh, and, 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 you know, it's uh, it, treatment of steno is a, is a very interesting thing because the, the drug of choice is, is trim sulfa uh, for no reason other than when steno first became a pathogen, uh, when it was back when it was pseudomonas maltophilia, uh, and then xanthomonas, it became, that was the drug that was available. We didn't really have other options. So there's never been randomized trials of trim sulfa versus anything else. Uh, and then uh, the in vitro susceptibility pattern, sometimes you'll get uh, essentially organisms that'll test susceptible sometimes to ceftazidime alone, uh, quinolones alone, minocycline and the tetracyclines. And there's clinical evidence, comparative studies of retrospective analyses of these. And uh, unfortunately, they're just not very informative because of selection bias and treatment bias. Um, and I would argue that even though these uh, drugs test susceptible in the test tube, 
that it's probably a false susceptibility. Um, as, as mentioned, the beta-lactamases are there to take care of the septazidine. Stenotrophomonas also has an intrinsic quinolone resistance gene, uh, a QNR gene that's in, on all stenotrophomonas. So even though we might test levofloxacin and says susceptible, I doubt that's actually the case. And uh, Joe Cuddy, if, uh, if he's here, and the folks over at uh, Hartford Hospital, they've done some really nice work in, in, in animals showing that probably the MIC breakpoints are far too high for stenotrophomonas. And so really what we're stuck with is the only drug that seems to probably work in, in, and is very hard to test in models is trimsulfa. Um, and we have some data that uh, is not yet published, um, but we're working on that actually shows that uh, compared to other drugs, it, at least in neutropenic patients, trimsulfa might uh, be associated with better outcomes than, uh, say, levofloxacin or minocycline. Yeah, and I've heard from several birds that the CLSI is working very hard to try to uh, correct that problem with this. So, um, so what, what else, uh, Maria Fernanda, what, what else in terms of resistance to the beta-lactams um, um, is special in this bug? Well, I, I, call, I, I like to think of Steno as a very greedy bacteria because it already has a ton of genes in the chromosome, you know, in the chromosome that provides resistance to a variety of, you know, antibiotics. But then it has some in, um, acquired resistance. So, for instance, um, cefidericol. You know, cefidericol in vitro works against steno. However, there are many reports of that the resistance is emerging, you know, via the mutation of Tom B and other mechanisms. So, it's like, oh, it was a very promising drug, but oh, resistance is already developing. And, and so, the same with um, um, Bactrim. It acquires the SUL1 and 2 genes and the DRFA, D, DRFA? The HFR. Gene, exactly. Uh, that are in uh, class 1 in integrons. So it now is becoming resistant to trimetropine sulfamethoxazole. Uh, so it's a greedy bacteria. Yeah, definitely. Uh, and, and this bug have this plasticity, this uh, ability to acquire these mobile elements and particularly the resistance, when you have resistance to trimetropine sulfamethoxazole, then resistance to other, particularly the fluoroquinolones, is just there. So in that scenario, uh, um, Sam, um, what options are now uh, available? You know, um, so let's talk about cefiderocol first, since Maria Fernanda talked about. What do you think about cefiderocol? Um, in, in stenotrophomonas maltophilia? Yeah, that's the, the burning question, isn't it? Uh, fortunately, the acquired tri trimethoprim sulfa resistance is relatively uncommon in the United States, but elsewhere in the world, India, it approaches 40, 50 percent. Um, so really challenging pathogen. Now, the cefiderocol is, is a, a fascinating drug because it, it has the uh, dual sort of uptake mechanism where it gets in just like any other beta-lactam. It's able to permeate across the membrane quite nicely because it's a, a non-polar uh, molecule and then has active uptake through the iron uptake system. So, and it's very stable against beta-lactamases, including L1 and L2. So it's a really attractive option and it's incredibly active in vitro against steno uh, as well as other gram negatives. The problem is, uh, and it looks great in animal models, it looks great in vitro models. The problem is when you get to the clinical data, it's murky at best. Uh, and in fact, in the um, uh, credible CR trial, which was the randomized trial of cefiderocol versus best available therapy, there were five patients in that trial, all of whom were randomized to the cefiderocol arm, and four of those five died. Uh, so the clinical data that we have that's available right now is completely contrasting with the available animal and in vitro evidence. And there are certainly case reports out there that are published of cefiderocol working, but I think the, the story on that is very much an open one. And uh, the vast majority of patients who are treated with cefiderocol or in these studies are not ones at a high risk of morbidity due to that organism. So it really, I think, needs to be studied additionally in higher risk patients such as uh, hematologic malignancy or cystic fibrosis. So it's, it's very interesting that uh, some of uh, my colleagues in Houston, Dr. Miller, has been studying cefiderocol resistant in pseudomonas aeruginosa because we published a paper of a patient that had cefidrocol resistance in the absence of uh, uh, exposure to the antibiotic. Mm -hmm. And what they found was a lot of these TOMV mutations, which is sort of the receptor that allows for, for, for the uh, oral porins to come, um, in, in the absence of any, so pre-cefidrocol exposure. 
And we've been doing some more uh, surveillance of that phenomenon, and there seems to be very common. Mm -hmm. um, and also, in the, the work coming from David Wise, this phenomenon of heteroresistance, which is very common in bacteria that is probably unappreciated clinically, make it more difficult. What do you think about that, uh, Maria Fernanda? The about heteroresistance. I think we, uh, you know, people that have worked in the lab has been observing that phenomena for years, but nobody has called it, you know? And now, oh yeah, it's heteroresistance. It's just the natural selection due to the action of one antibiotic. So, yeah. and, and, and to avoid that, I think combination therapy, you know, that's the key. Correct, and that's, that's something that I'm going to um, ask Sam, uh, because I feel and it's probably putting you on the spot that using cefidirocol alone, particularly for a steno, is a bit risky. Would you agree? I completely agree. And, and, but this is the greatest unsettled question in ID is whether combination therapy is better than monotherapy. And all the data that's available uh, for pseudomonas suggests that definitive combo therapy is no better. Now, it, it makes intuitive sense that you have a resistant subpopulation that's resistant to one drug but not another. Uh, the combination would work, and that's why we use combo therapy for TB or combo therapy for chemotherapy. Um, but uh, whether I, int I believe that combo therapy is likely better for steno, but I have no evidence really supporting that. Uh, that clinically it matters. Uh, and so that's really the great disconnect. And it's almost, uh, it's almost like a mythology at this point in ID, whether you use combo or not for these non-fermenters. And you can't convince the combo people to use mono and the mono people to use combo. Correct. So we need data, right? Yes. So, uh, Maria Fernanda, you published a paper, I remember one of the first clinical, challenging clinical cases of antimicrobial resistance was on stenotrophomonas maltophilia. And, and that derived from an observation in the lab of the combination of ceftacidim avivactam plus astreonam with the rationale to inhibit with astreonam the, your preferred love enzyme L1 and then use uh, avivactam for the other enzymes to allow ceftacidim to work. And, you know, this is something that has been used now and I personally have used, you know, successfully as a as a, a, a very anecdotal experience. So tell me about that paper and, 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 and what's the rationale for this? Uh, so, yeah, so I, I was training with Dr. Robert Bonomo and we, I've always been studying metalloperolactamases, but I've also been uh, involved with other inhibitors of uh, class A or serine perolactamases as adivactam. And I, I remember that day because it was Friday, 4.30 p.m. I was so Always tired. Friday. <laughs> Always Friday. And I received a call, and he was like, we received a clinical strain we need to test right now. And I was like, really? <laughs> I had to do the media. I had to do everything. I was a steno. It was growing so slowly. And uh, I was, and, and we, you know, we were starting, starting to study the L1, and, and we knew that, L1 as a metallo cannot hydrolyze astronaut. It's, it's just mechanistically impossible. And so we thought of the combination. Was we were, you know, we had the uh, avibactam in our minds because we constantly were working with avibactam and, you know, Kasavi. And then we said, okay, it has an L1. Astronaut cannot, you know, it cannot be hydrolyzed by that. If we inhibit the L2 with avibactam, therefore, the uh, astronaut, the cannot be hydrolyzed by the L1, can just go to the PVPs, you know, PVP3, and then with the, with the um, ceftacidine, we can target the other PVP, and so that, that should work. So to make a very long story short, I was there all weekend, because the steno was growing so slowly, oh my goodness, and then when I saw the inhibition zone between the two discs of Hasavi and then Astronam, I remember it was already Sunday, 8 a.m., and I said, like, I got it. I got the result. And then he communicated with the treating patient, or the treating physician. And then uh, that kid, it was a, a pediatric patient, has been with a um, bloodstream infection due to a steno for, if my memory works, more than a month. And he has already been on different treatments, including frimatropine sulfa. Nothing worked. We changed, you know, we know. The physician just changed the therapy, and 10 days later, the uh, infection was cured.
Yeah, a beautiful story of translational medicine, really, from the molecule to the patient. So now putting it in context, and this data comes from, from what we have been doing with NDMs and others to combine this. So clinically, for the data we have available, Sam, what do you think about that combination for a steno? Yeah, so it's, uh, we don't have great data at this point. It's, it's uh, anic data, as they say, uh, for steno. But we actually do have very reasonable data for the other metallos that this is an effective treatment strategy. There's a great um, uh, observational study from uh, the folks in Italy comparing septazidine, maybe Bactam plus as trianam for uh, NDM producers uh, to best available therapy. And it's way more effective and way less toxic, as has been the case with all the new uh, beta-lactam antibiotics. We have very good in vitro evidence that this combination should work mechanistically. It makes beautiful sense. Uh, and animal models suggest that. And, and certainly I've used the combination myself and, um, you know, uh, uh, that case was, was just wonderful. And I've had similar cases of persistent infection that will not clear on anything, including trim sulfa and then septazidine, maybe back to MS trianam, uh, really, really works for them. So we don't have compelling data at this point, but I am comfortable saying that if I can't use trim sulfa for whatever reason, or it fails, that's my backup of choice. And I, I, I skip over the minocyclines and the levofloxacin and then go straight for that combination. Okay, great. So the, the last group of drugs I want to the, uh, discuss briefly are the tetracyclines and glycycyclines, you know, minocyclines and now, so eravacyclines, maybe tigacycline, um, proleomatacycline will, will have some activity. So what, what's your opinion on those drugs? Oof, it's a tough one. So uh, they're interesting uh, compounds. They're, they're very active. They're um, not uh, terribly well effluxed by most of the uh, resistance mechanisms that Steno has. So you'll typically find act in vitro activity, um, uh, however that's defined, for these drugs, tigacycline, minocycline, even doxycycline. I think there are a couple of key problems with, with these drugs uh, that makes uh, use of them pretty challenging. Um, the first is that the breakpoints for these drugs is likely very inappropriately high. So the susceptibility breakpoint for minocycline is, is four. And when you look at that from a, a PKPD perspective based on what we know about the drug, it should probably be somewhere in the 0 0.5 range. Uh, so when we go from looking, if you look at steno now using current breakpoints, uh, about 99% of them are susceptible or 100% are susceptible to minocycline, but it really should probably be more in the 80, 75, 80% range. Um, the other issue that we have uh, is just really related to PKPD of these drugs. Tigacycline and aravacycline are probably marginal PKPD at best. They have this uh, weird concentration-dependent protein binding phenomenon. And nobody really truly understands how these drugs work from a great PKPD perspective. And so whether you can get the exposures that you need to treat these organisms, um, especially in the respiratory setting where they're often pathogens, is, is unclear. Um, and you mentioned omatocycline, where yes, you can get, you can certainly get an MIC for the drug, just as you can for anything. Uh, but the the PK exposures of omatocycline render it what I think would be almost completely useless. Um, so I think overall, if I had to use one of those drugs, I think, and I, I do use these uh, in certain scenarios, I think minocycline is likely the best bet. Uh, but uh, whether we're getting adequate exposures for these these drugs, I think, is uh, very much an unanswered question. And and this could be. Um the combination strategy, a, a drug that could, could be used. Correct. I typically, when I do use these, uh, you know, granted, we always find these patients who are probably colonized, but we need to treat somehow in any ways. That's when I'll use monotherapy. But for a person who's really sick, and I believe it's the steno doing it, I, I would use those generally as part of combination therapy um, with either uh, ceftazidine, maybe Bactam, as trianam, or, or, or trim sulfa. You were going to say something? No, I... <laughs> I was just thinking that I, you, if you read the literature, all the reports of susceptibility to minocycline is are great. They say like almost no resistance to minocycline, but I always wondering then why it's not used in clinic so you know widely. And then I, I think I just got my answer. So thank you. Yeah, there's there's different reasons, but we we do tend to use it a lot lately uh, for for different reasons. So we have uh, five minutes left, and uh, I'm going to do something that I'm, we've never done before, is we have a beautiful audience. So does, is there any questions? Are there any questions for, for our speakers? Please, I will repeat it. Uh, yes, oh, there is a microphone, by the way, for questions. Oh, sorry, I just figured it out. So we have to take advantage of this audience. Spur of the moment. You know how I am, Ray. Hello, though. I know you are. You're beautiful. Thank you. Uh, great talk. And, and actually, the, the topic caught my mind because 
we're, we're involved in an outbreak of Stenotrophomonas among patients that's linked to the hospital water system in a hospital that we're surveilling at the moment. But I'm just curious if you've seen anything about um, co-isolation of Stenotrophomonas with other pathogens. So a lesser known fact of the Iraq war uh, with the Acinetobacter problem that they had at Walter Reed was there was an awful lot of Stenotrophomonas isolated alongside the Acinetobacter. But of course, everybody was focused on the Acinetobacter. And, but I noticed as I was going through the patient charts, there was so much Stenotrophomonas co being, being isolated at the same time as Acinetobacter. And I, I'm kind of seeing the same thing with this hospital that we're looking at with Pseudomonas aeruginosa, where the exact same environmental reservoir has both of these bugs sitting inside the hospital plumbing. So, so I'm just curious yeah, if you've come across Great, that great question, co-isolation of organisms. I'm gonna give it to you first. Yeah, and actually it's, it's fascinating that you bring up that exact scenario, the uh, uh, Iraq veterans. Uh, and uh, I have had this hypothesis for a long time uh, that steno and acinetobacter, carbapenemersis and acinetobacter, uh, basically are, are mutually exclusive, and it seems that might not be the case. The reason why I think they'd be mutually exclusive is they have the same ecologic niche selected for by carbapenem use. Um, uh, but anyways, I'd, I'd love to talk to you further about this. But in terms of co-isolation, it's it, very frequent. Um, and for a number of different reasons, either you have a host who's uh, due to underlying medical conditions such as bronchiectasis, cystic fibrosis, is unable to clear pathogens from their lungs. Uh, so you might get environmental organisms that come in contact. So Pseudomonas and Steno are a classic combination in cystic fibrosis patients. Or if you have a, uh, say, a polytrauma with environmental exposures, there's going to be multiple pathogens involved in that. Um, so you might get stenotrophomonas plus skin flora plus other gram negatives from the environment like a chromobacter or acinetobacter in, in, in these cases. So it's actually very common to see these as polymicrobial infections. Um, I, I'd, I'd wager it's one of the more common polymicrobial organisms we find. Yeah, and from the microbiological standpoint, there are beautiful works that show that steno and um, Pseudomonas aeruginosa are synergistic. They, you know, they build a community, uh, they build the biofilm together, one provides the nutrients, one provides the colonization, and they, they, they are synergistic, you know, doing the biofilm in the lung. The, the, the opposite is, uh, has been uh, shown for steno and Aspergillus fumigatus. Actually, the steno inhibits the growth of Aspergillus in the lung. So that's an example of how the community... And the, the clear conundrum here is which is the pathogen and which should you treat. And, and that is, you know, even with the best clinicians, it's a very difficult uh, question to answer. But Okay, guys, we are running out of time, unfortunately. Um, and uh, it's been a great podcast. Thank you very much. Uh, remember, we have an episode in uh, Editors in Conversations every month. And I thank you, everybody, for being here. Thank you, our guests. And this is Cesar Arias, Editor-in-Chief of Antimicrobial Agents of Chemotherapy, signing off. Thank you. Thank you.